Hi. So I wanted to go over some of the basics of the Berner, Lasaga, and Garrels um, model called the Blag model. <clears throat> they proposed this in 1983, and then uh, Rob Berner updated it in 1991, called it GeoCarb, and then in 99, 1994 called GeoCarb 2, and then the latest version is 2001 called GeoCarb 3. That's the paper we're going to be reading. Um, there is a later paper, GeoCarb Sulf, that includes a sulfur cycle, and it's intended to model not just CO2 concentrations, but also oxygen concentrations, which is pretty cool. But that wasn't really where I wanted to go with this particular lecture, so I'm restricting this to just geocarb and just looking at CO2. Now, one of the things that um, we can think about is that if you look at the rate of CO2 uh, production and consumption, weathering will ultimately consume CO2. It, it takes CO2, or it can consume CO2. Um, it can take CO2, combine it with calcium or magnesium, and precipitate calcium and magnesium carbonates. And you can imagine that the more weathering there is, the more, the more carbonate deposition there is, the more CO2 that you remove. Um, now, if you consider that volcanoes are just producing CO2, there's some net production of, of volcanoes. And let's just assume that, that that's a, a constant uh, through time regardless of what the, uh, what the, the CO2 is um, in the atmosphere. Now there's a point where these are going to be balanced, so whatever is coming into the atmosphere from volcanoes is being removed from the atmosphere by weathering and, and carbon deposition. And so that's going to be in balance. Now it's very important with respect to the Blag models that they assume that there is this balance between inputs of CO2 and outputs of CO2. Um, and one of the reasons that they, they do this is that if you look at models from Berner and Caldera 1997, you find that if you have more CO2 outgassing, so we're, we're, sitting, we're sitting over here, there's more CO2 outgassing than CO2 uptake, then within 10 or 20 million years, the CO2 concentration of the atmosphere becomes like an atmosphere of CO2. It's all CO2. Whereas if you sit over here, you have more that's being taken out by weathering, 25% uh, excess in weathering, then you basically strip CO2 out of the atmosphere within a million or two million years. And so the idea then is there has to be this balance, broadly speaking, um, over the duration of Earth's history. Otherwise, we would have atmospheres that have either they are all CO2 or they, are not, they have no CO2. And so this is the, the long-term carbon cycle. So in this, um, the green uh, values are, are reservoirs. And this is, I, what is this, 10 to the 15th grams, I think it is. Um, red is the flux of carbon, and blue is the delta C13 value of that carbon reservoir. And so you can see there's an atmosphere, the biosphere, sedimentary organic carbon, uh, sedimentary carbonates, um, the ocean and the mantle, and each of these has different amounts of carbon in it, has different rates of, uh, I think this is modern, uh, fluxes of carbon, and um, each of these has distinct uh, delta C13 values. Um, and so really what Berner was saying is that there is CO2 input to the atmosphere and then there's CO2 drawdown from the atmosphere. So the inputs are thermal breakdown of uh, carbonates and organic carbon, so diagenesis, metamorphism, volcanism, um, weathering of carbonates, um, and the oxidation of organic carbon. And then silicate weathering ultimately creates the carbonates that then get buried, so that's carbonate burial. Um, and then there's organic carbon, straight up organic carbon burial. And there's a bunch of simplified um, reactions here. Um, here's one where um, the weathering of calcium silicates and magnesium silicates generically ultimately produce calcium carbonate plus silica and the calcium carbonate then gets buried. And then here is a reaction where you have some kind of organic carbon that gets oxidized by critters or whatever. Uh, to produce CO2. So this is putting CO2 back into the uh, atmosphere. Okay, so very uh, schematically, this is how um, the models are put together. There's a carbonate carbon uh, reservoir, or an organic carbon reservoir, 
and an ocean and atmospheric carbon reservoir. And then there are fluxes among all of these. And so over here, we have the carbonate fluxes. There is a flux from M. M is metamorphism and volcanism. We just think of it as metamorphism, thermal release of, of CO2. Thermal release, of the breakdown of, of carbonates. And then there's also the weathering of carbonates. So you take CaCO3 and you dissolve it with whatever silicic acid. It produces CO2, puts CO2 in the atmosphere. So these both go into the atmosphere. There's also weathering of organic carbon. So that would be organic carbon plus O2 react to form CO2. And then there's metamorphic degassing of, of uh, organic carbon as well. So those could actually be reactions like graphite plus O2 goes to CO2. It could also be the release of methane, metamorphic methane, into the atmosphere that then reacts with water to produce CO2. Um, or oxygen to produce CO2. And then the fluxes uh, to back into these, um, these boxes are the flux of burial carbon and uh, the burial flux of, of carbonate. And so basically whatever's being dumped into the atmosphere has to be balanced by whatever is being uh, buried um, out, of the, out of the atmosphere. And this burial, the burial removes CO2 and it's linked to silicate weathering by those reactions that I was just mentioning. So there are two basic equations that have to be satisfied. There's the mass balance of carbon. That's exactly what I was just talking about before. The, the fluxes of carbonate and organic carbon to the atmosphere have to be balanced by the fluxes of carbonate and organic carbon into the sedimentary record. There also has to be mass balance of isotopes, and I'll explain why we need this. Um, ultimately, it has to do with trying to constrain the flux of, of the buried carbon. But basically what this says is that if you take the isotope composition of the carbonate times the fluxes of the uh, carbonate component that's going into the atmosphere, and the delta C13 of organic carbon times the fluxes that are going into the um, atmosphere, then they have to be balanced by the carbon isotope composition of carbonate that's being buried times its flux plus the carbonate composition of, uh, sorry, the, the isotope composition of the organic carbon times the flux of the carbon that's being buried. Um, and here, this isn't actually correct, that this is not the way to write it, but basically what they're trying to say is that there's an isotope fractionation between carbonate and carbon, and it's like I can't remember off the top of my head, 25 per mil, something like that. And so this is just a way to reference everything on this side of the equation to the delta C13 of carbonate that's been buried. Why do we do that? Because we have a good carbonate record and we can measure that. Now the sizes of the reservoirs can increase or decrease. So if you look at the carbonate reservoir, whatever comes uh, gets buried um, is... Uh, minus whatever is put back into the um, atmosphere and oceans um, is going to increase the, the carbonate. And so here, the burial carbon, if the, if the flux of buried carbon is greater than the flux of weathered carbon and organic carbon and metamorphosed and volcanic carbon, then, um, then the, the uh, organic carbon reservoir is going to increase. Okay, so that's just a uh, the, the constraint that if the fluxes don't balance, then these reservoirs can increase in, in size. Um, that's one way to, to keep the Earth from getting into this runaway system, by the way. Um, and this also has um, knock-on effects for um, the carbon isotope compositions. So if you take this equation and you say, if I'm changing this carbon, the, the size of this carbon reservoir, then the change in its isotope composition has to be balanced by the fluxes into and out of those reservoirs times the delta C13 values of the carbon uh, that's coming in. So this is the um, carbonate, um, and then this is the uh, comparable mass balance equation for organic carbon. This is then the, that difference between organic carbon and uh, carbonate. So now, <laughs> why would the fluxes change? Well, the fluxes, de the fluxes depend on the amount that's stored in the rocks, so those are the reservoir sizes, 
the climate, so if temperature changes, then the fluxes can change, and the exposure, which is the geography. So if there's more land exposed, then you could, for example, uh, produce more, uh, you could weather more carbonates and put more uh, CO2 into the atmosphere faster. The, um, the metamorphic and volcanic flux depends on the spreading rate. And so they have a spreading rate that they've specified. This then defines the changes in metamorphic and volcanic flux uh, through time. And then there's a question of whether carbon is buried on the shelves versus the deep sea, and they specify um, how they're going to partition that. But the idea there is that that defines how much carbon is going into subduction zones, and then the subduction zones are degassing carbon. Um, there's the um, net burial of carbonate, which is equal to, so this is the, the, um, the amount that's buried minus the amount that's weathered. That has to be balanced by the flux that's associated with silicate weathering. So those are those reactions that ultimately produce MgCO3 or CaCO3 that then get deposited. And um, that flux, silicate flux, um, silicate weathering, depends on the temperature, it depends on the climate, it depends on the geography. They talk about um, the efficacy of, um, of silicate weathering depending on um, uplift, that kind of thing. Are plants there or not? Have they evolved yet? What plants have evolved? All of that affects the efficacy of silicate weathering. And then um, there's this one, the net burial of organic carbon. Now that one depends on chemistry and circulation of the ocean primarily. It can sort of be specified or parameterized, but they, they don't want to do that. And, it, and it's because um, they want to infer that from other, uh, as, as part, as a, as a dependent variable of the um, equations that they develop. And what's really key in all of this is are all the feedbacks. So there are lots of different feedbacks to the weathering of silicates. There is, remember, this is the, the flux that's being buried minus the flux that's being weathered. And so there's a weathering feedback here, and it depends on temperature and CO2 concentration. Silicates weather faster at higher temperature and CO2. There's a relief factor, that's topographic relief, higher relief, more weathering. There's a land plant effect, more plants, more weathering, changes through time because of evolution. And then there's a, um, there's a geographic term here, which is the, um, it's, it's basically a factor that's related to land area ratio, how much is above sea level, how much is rather relative to today, and then a discharge ratio um, past relative today. That's actually determined from general circulation models. Um, and they have this exponent that, that says that at some point, if you just keep washing stuff, then you don't get as much. It doesn't go linearly with, uh, with discharge. This then is the weathering rate, the silicate weathering rate today. So everything is referenced to today. And then this is the, the weathering feedback. So this is the temperature and CO2 dependence. It's this term, which has an activation energy and has temperature, has a runoff term here. All of these terms come into here. This one is, um, this term is an important one. This is a new one in, um, in uh, Berner and Kotavala. Um, that's based on general circulation models of the dependence of predicted temperature, global temperature, on CO2 concentration. And so that's where Kotavala comes in here. That's where that term comes from, is a whole series of experiments that say, if I double the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, this is the change in temperature of the atmosphere. As, and so it's, uh, its term apparently is related to the log of the, of the uh, concentration of of CO2. WS is um, the solar irradiance. Okay, so these are going back 500, 600 million years. So solar irradiance back then was um, not as intense as it is today. And so this is then normalized over 570 million years. So it's assumed to increase linearly. And then there's a geographic term and that thing is really not specified very well, but it, it's basically looking at the distribution of continents. Um, the uh, effect of, of um, CO2, <laughs> the CO2 term, that one depends on whether there are plants and whether there are not plants. And so this is what they use. They, they have a term here 
before vascular plants evolve in the Devonian 350 million years ago. And then they have the, this, this exponent here, which is related to um, whether there are vascular plants and what vascular plants uh, they are, because plants accelerate weathering. So here's their uplift parameter. They're, they're basically looking at changes in volume of sediment through time. So this is a record. Um, so this is 550 million years ago. These are the volumes of sediment, the changes in volumes of sediment per unit time. And what you see is that it steadily increases and goes way, way up to the modern. That's probably a preservation thing. Okay, and so what they do is they fit a very simple curve through here and say that's what's going on on average. And so here there's more uplift and erosion and here there's less uplift and erosion than in other, than on average, than relative to a modern day kind of uh, behavior. Now this is new to, to use this particular parameterization. The earlier versions used strontium isotope records but those depend on the age of the material that's eroding. And so if you look at the Andes, they're really young. They have a really low strontium 87-86 ratio. Weathering a silicate there produces a very different isotope composition than weathering the lesser Himalaya in the Indo-Asian collision, which has a really high 87-86 ratio. And the strontium also assumes that it's coming from silicates, that the, the isotope record in the ocean is a reflection of silicates. And in fact, strontium that's coming out of the Himalaya is dominated by carbonate weathering. So the whole premise to the strontium isotope um, parameterization is, is, a little, is a little fishy. Um, and so they recognize that, and so they're trying to use something different. And then there's all kinds of questions. We've, we've talked about this before of, you know, what are the uplift rates? Do they increase through time? Um, or is this just, uh, you know, the record uh, bias in the record that we're looking at? But this is how they try to address bias. Plant weathering, they don't really know that very well, but it's something that they modify. And the important thing is that there are um, trees, essentially, um, evolved during the Devonian. Okay, so that's going to change uh, weathering characteristics in 350 million years ago. And then angiosperms, which are like maple trees, those kind of trees, um, and grasses too, um, evolved during the Cretaceous. And this really changes um, the uh, character of weathering um, on the surface of the Earth. So that's another factor that is taken into account. Here's an example of land area. So this is their record of land area through time, 570 million years ago to, uh, to zero. This is, a, this is basically a sea level curve. And so where sea level is low, land area is high. And where sea level is high, land area is low. So that's how they get at land area. Strontium isotopes, this is what I was talking about. This is the strontium isotope record. And if you were to just look at what you would get without any input from weathering of the continents, it should look like this. And so there's a difference between these two isotope compositions that has been interpreted in some cases in, in terms of weathering of silicates and, and consequently the drawdown of CO2. That's what that strontium isotope record is, uh, is based on, though. Tectonic degassing is spreading rate, and so there are times when there's a higher spreading rate and um, greater rates of CO2 degassing, um, mainly from volcanic arcs and subduction. And then there are times today, like today, when the, the uh, degassing rate is pretty, pretty, pretty small um, because the spreading rate is um, slower. Um, we can estimate the flux of carbonate and um, that one's a little tricky. The flux of carbonate um, is, well, this is the flux of carbonate from weathering. And they just have this standard curve that they put in here. They also put in these other two curves that says that it's somehow parameterized according to the um, surface area that is exposed. And so here's a term that is just the surface area, it's proportional to the surface area. This is one that's proportional to the surface area squared. And so that's something that they try in, uh, a lot of this is in um, uh, Geocarb 2. Um, solar flux, if you um, go back in time and you say uh, the, the, 
if you say there was no change in solar flux, then here's a particular model that they ran where there's um, where the solar flux is constant. If there's less solar flux in the past, then to maintain any kind of temperature balance, you have to have a higher concentration of CO2. You got to put, you got to store that energy better, and so that's where these high uh, CO2 concentrations come in, 16 times modern day. Um, and you can actually see that if you were to just say, look, I'm not even going to try to hold temperature. Uh, um, sorry, I'm not going to model temperature. I'll just have a constant temperature from now. This is what you would have to do to CO2 to maintain a constant temperature back to 570 million years ago. It would have to go up by a factor of eight because solar irradiance is lower at 570 million years ago. Plants. We don't really know how plants are affecting this. That's, a, that's not a very well-constrained parameter. Um, but there is a big change that has to occur at 350 million years ago. So that's why these um, converge at, it's actually, there's a, there's a transition so that they converge at 300 million years ago. Um, but these are different parameterizations when there are no plants. So when I think about this, I, I come back to what's a very general picture. The reservoirs are large, and they really don't change very much. Um, and so what we really want to solve is this one. We want to solve this flux balance. And we have handles on all of these terms from various proxies. But we don't have a very good proxy for the flux of burial carbon. And so, oops, I forgot to put the equation in here. So what we do is we use the carbon isotope equation, which is, is equivalent, basically, right? It says that you've got to account for the delta C13 values. We use the, carb, the delta C13 record as a, as a second simultaneous equation. And so you end up with this equation plus the carbon isotope equation. You solve them simultaneously. And what you get out of it is the flux of burial carbon and um, as ultimately the CO2 concentration of, um, of the uh, atmosphere. And so here, basically what it comes down to is that if you have a greater flux of buried carbon, organic carbon, the delta C13 of organic carbon is really low, so the car delta C13 record of, the, of carbonates is going to increase when organic carbon is being buried more. And it turns out they have also estimated the flux of buried carbon from rocks, and it sort of follows the flux that's interpreted from, um, from carbon isotopes. But um, uh, so in some ways, they're, they're kind of comparable, but they, they do prefer the carbon isotope uh, trend because it's um, independent of the preservation potential. OK, so that's just to lay the framework. That is. Um, Geocarb 2, and then from there, we should be able to look at Geocarb 3, see, talk a little bit about the changes that I, that I mentioned, and look at some of those other uh, figures that they have in there to identify what they're varying and uh, what the effect of those uh, variables might be. All right. Bye.